Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mom Hour, and welcome to part two of our special three-part series about holiday shopping. I'm Sarah Powers, here as always with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. Yeah, we're back in your feed today talking about something we both love to do, but that it turns out we do in very different ways, and that is to buy from small businesses during the holiday and also giving handmade and artisan-made gifts to the people on our lists. Also, just a reminder that this is part of a special series, so the episode will be a little shorter than our typical Tuesday show. We dropped an episode yesterday about planning and organizing our shopping, and tomorrow we'll be rounding out the series with a show about what we do after the gifts are bought, how we keep them organized, find time and space to wrap, and actually open the gifts with friends and family. We hope you'll listen to all three and let us keep you company this holiday week. And if you've got some shopping planned this weekend, we hope this episode will give you some inspiration. We'll get right into it after the break. We are welcoming back our sponsor for this special series, Privacy Guard. It's a credit monitoring and identity theft protection service that offers triple bureau 24-7 credit monitoring so you can have more peace of mind as you do your holiday shopping and spending. You know, Megan, it is not even December, but already this week I've put my credit card info into half a dozen retailers that I've never shopped from before. And it never really occurred to me that this time of year is kind of the perfect storm for data and credit attacks. If a store where you shop gets breached or a hacker steals your card information, your credit could take a big hit and you might not even realize it for quite a while. Yeah. And how about when you get one of those emails from a retailer telling you that your data might have been compromised? Oh, yeah. That always unnerves me. I feel like I get them all the time. And then it sends me down this rabbit hole of trying to make sure my credit hasn't changed and everything looks okay. So I love the idea of having Privacy Guard monitoring my credit score for drops and notifying me if certain changes are detected to my credit files. When you have Privacy Guard's credit protection or total protection plan, you get monthly triple bureau credit reports and text or email alerts if there's a change to your credit score, which is great. I'll be honest, I have enough on my plate in the next few weeks and anything I can trust to somebody else sounds amazing. I'll let Privacy Guard keep an eye on my credit score and I will go back to trying to figure out what to get my tween for Christmas. Unless, I don't know, maybe they could help me with that too. That would be nice. (laughs) Again, thanks to Privacy Guard for partnering with us on the special holiday shopping series. To learn more, check out privacyguard.com. Okay, so Sarah, one of the things I've noticed is that you and I both love to shop small businesses and buy things from artisans and makers, but I tend to buy in person and you tend to buy online. And we talked a little bit about that in our episode um, yesterday, but let's get into a little more of the details. So give us some of your favorite places to buy online. Well, first, I want to say that this has changed a lot for me in the last few years. I mean, Etsy's been around for what seems like forever in internet history, but I used to really like this idea in theory and have a really hard time executing online shopping for small business and maker handmade stuff. And I I think honestly, what's changed mostly is that I'm out of the trenches of motherhood. I have more time. 
I have more time. We talked a lot about yesterday about how far ahead I can plan and all that. So um, I think I've just gotten a little better with practice, but I also do have some specific retailer recommendations. And I think the internet has also made these things easier for us. I think there's a more basic level of trust in buying something that's maybe vintage or handmade um, than there used to be. Remember the early eBay days and you just never like, oh, yeah. knew if it was legit and it and just, the photos weren't very good. Right. And yeah, it felt like a, it felt like a risk. And I feel like yes. it now it feels like shopping on Amazon or target, yeah. but these retailers. Okay. So I'll list off a few. Um, Etsy, of course, is the one everybody knows about. Um, and a little later on in this episode, I have some some tips for how to browse because Etsy has so much stuff. But I have had great experience. I really rely on the on the shop reviews and on reading, you know, people's feedback. But I've had great experience, and I I've just started to experiment more. Like, doesn't I don't need to know the artist or the artisan. Um, I can just make a purchase. Um, Minted is another one. So we've been fans of Minted for a while. And Minted has, if you're not familiar, they make beautiful holiday cards. They also have original art and gifts based on um, different artists' work. And they always include a little bio or a little profile of the artist whose work you're buying. Um, I do feel like I should say that I don't know what the advantages to different artists and artisans are of being on these sites. I mean, we know as creators that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, It does seem like Minted, the marketplace at Minted seems to really lift up it's artists and you kind of can like get to know them via their profile and all that. But I, I don't actually know that for sure. Do you, do you happen to know that? Well, I, what I do know, I, I mean, this is just a, not a guess, an educated guess. I feel like this is something that's on my radar. Um, I think it's more exclusive on minted. Uh Yes. Um, It's it's heavily curated. And I think you can find stuff on minted from those artists you can't find anywhere else. So I think that gives it like a, like a leveled up um, feel. That I think is helpful, but I don't know what their cut is or anything like that. Yes, exactly. I think that was a good way to put it. Whereas Etsy is more of like your swap meet open marketplace. Mm -hmm. So a little less vetting Um, minted would be like walking into like a gallery of where they have chosen the artists. Um, And I mean, to me as a shopper, it's not good or bad. The price points at minted are higher, although I've found some really affordable things there. And I've had a lot of fun shopping, shopping minted. They're also continuing to add to the types of things they offer. So it used to be mostly prints, art prints and framed prints and gifts um, of that nature. But I got some um, cloth dinner napkins on there once that were a, like it was basically the fabric was the art. So the the artist had, you know, painted or designed the fabric. So that's a favorite one. Um, Do you get the uncommon goods catalog? No. Oh, you don't? I've heard. I mean, I know of Uncommon Goods, but I don't get the catalog. Okay. The catalog is kind of funny. It is a little bit, it's a little zany. It's like, it's the type of things that no one ever needs. It's very like novelty (laughs) gifts. Um, But I have noticed that they also are featuring their makers and artists and they'll tell you where they are and how this thing is made. And so it's, it's a great place to look for ideas. Even if you don't end up making a purchase, you might see something in there that you're like, oh, I might look for that type of thing in my local craft fair or something like that. That's a fun one. Um, Redbubble is my latest find for any kind of, uh, like t-shirt or tote bag with whatever obscure thing you want printed on it. So like they have t-shirts with literally anything on them. You can also, I think like you could upload your own design and make a t-shirt real quick on Redbubble if you want, but mostly you're shopping other people's, um, t-shirt print designs and they, and mugs and, um, tote bags and anything. And somehow I stumbled on it when there was like this obscure graphic that Allegra really wanted printed on a shirt. And sure enough, like we found it on Redbubble. I bought, I already bought Brian a gift on Redbubble, like a, a t-shirt with an obscure television reference. So kind of fun to browse. Um, but again, it's all, it, they will tell you who, who made it and you know, their shop will have reviews and all of that. eBay. I only do if it's something very specific I'm looking for. So I have looked for vintage or used things on eBay before, but I don't have a lot of eBay experience, but it's there. Um, and then finally, I think Instagram is making it a lot easier to shop directly from artists and artisans. Like there's the little shop now. And if you see makers that you admire and there's a shop now and you can click through and to, and support them that way, it's huge. Cause then you're probably going right to their website. And, um, that's just a huge thing for makers this time of year. So that's one good thing about social media, I guess they're, they're feeding us content that's they think we might want to see. And in mm. many cases, that might be something really cool. I discovered, um, I've mentioned them before, but it's called the essential calendar. Um, and it's a cool wall hanging calendar that shows three months at a time. So I did one for summer because you can see the whole summer on one sheet. 
And I saw that on Instagram, like randomly. I, I think a, a listener sent it to me, but that that kind of thing pops up on Instagram. Those are mine. Um, while you were talking, it occurred to me that like I have ordered from a lot of different places, like kind of a one-off gift idea. Like last year, I ordered personalized socks with our cat's face on them. I just saw an ad for that. Like this but the year. funny thing is the photo didn't work. And like, I finally oh. ended up canceling the order because like I couldn't get a good photo of my cat looking at the camera. I mean, go figure, right? Yeah. But, but but every year I have find something like a funny t-shirt for yeah. one of the kids or like um, minted prints and stuff like that. But what I'm not good at, and I don't know if you are doing this either. So is this something where like you go in thinking I'm going to give this person a cool handmade artisan gift or I want a, like a certain number of those kinds yeah. of things? Or is it more like this is a cool idea, I'm going to get it, but it doesn't have to fit in a certain way into the bigger plan? So this is funny because this like perfectly dovetails off the conversation we had yesterday, which is like you start with your planning and your list, but at some point there's some browsing that happens. And for right. me, I start by browsing when I'm trying to think of gift ideas for people. I start by browsing these sites um, and and I keep it to the sites I know. Um, and so with Minted, it's a real it's more curated, as you said. So I will just see what they have. And then I will think that's a good gift for so and so on my list. And so, okay. yeah, you so kind of back at you the gift first and then you back into the person. Sometimes there have been yeah. times where I'm like, I'm looking for, you know, like a vintage like print of this nature or whatever. And I have real specific, so I guess it can work both ways, but often I, I like to see the list that they're curating on these sites and kind of like spend uh, like idle time on my phone, clicking around. And then that then informs the buying list. So let's talk about this browsing thing, because we talked about in yesterday's episode, how for me, often I just don't know what I want until I see it. And I mean like really see it. Yeah. (laughs) Because the buying of artisan made things can be so tactile, so experiential. Plus, when you go into like a craft fair or um, into an art co-op or something, it's all kind of arranged for you and like set up in a way and you're not getting exactly that experience online. So how do you kind of recreate that for yourself? Okay, so um, a few specific things. One, this is much more fun to do early in the season. I know we talked yesterday about there's no there's no shame in doing some last minute shopping. But I would say that for maker and artisan online, last minute, it's pretty difficult and it feels stressful. Cause like you said, then you're not seeing it. You don't know how long it's going to take to ship. Oh wait, this person's in Canada. So this is something for me that's fun in like November, the browsing. Um, my second thing would be mo- a lot of these sites will curate gift guides or lists, and that's a great place to start. So th- it might say something like gifts for him, gifts for her, gifts under $50. Just start clicking around to get your get the ideas moving. And then to me, that leads like down a rabbit hole. Then I'll click something and think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if they have that in a smaller size or a different price point. Or I wonder if I could get that same idea, but over on Etsy for cheaper. And then I might bounce over. Do you know what I mean? So browse the gift guides, the curated lists, I think is a great tip. And then when, when it is a case where you are looking for something specific, I have found that Etsy, especially there is so much stuff on there. You have to be dead specific with your, um, search terms. Like usually like a more general search would bring up, you know, lots of things you want to look at with Etsy. It seems to bring up like nothing I want to look at unless I am. Have you ever looked at the keywords like in an Etsy item description? People go crazy with yes, the yes. way things are labeled. It's like, yes. a whole, so I think I've kind of started to crack the code and I will say the more specific, the better. So I'll give a couple examples. Um, I wanted to get you a gift that involved a heron, like the bird. Yes. Now, luckily that's a really specific thing. So I knew it would come right up. So I searched like heron art print or something. If I had searched bird art print, I, I would be there for 40. I'd have a Robin Yeah, and I would have given up. So, <laughs> yes. so heron is an example of something that is just, it's very specific and it was meaningful for a reason. Um, for Valentine's day last year, I, my kids were all in piano lessons or Violet was about to start. And I wanted to get them little tote bags with their names on them for their piano books. And so I searched like personalized piano lesson tote bags. Like, I mean the whole thing. And sure enough, I found a really cute like just a screen printing maker. Well, they're not, they're not fancy at all. They were like $12, but they, you could choose the color of your bag and the color of what was printed on it and personalize it. And it was perfect. So that was really specific. Um, yesterday I was searching, have you ever had a mug with a little ceramic surprise inside, like a little figurine? Oh, like when you get to the bottom, it's like, yes, I I have not had one, but I've, I have, um, consumed, I don't don't like to use the word drink. I know. Or drunk. I have (laughs) or drunk. drunk. I have consumed liquids out of those. And it is such a fun little surprise when you get to it. It's really cute. And we, my mom has one that all the kids love. And 
we had these Christmas ones and they started cracking and breaking. So I was searching for those and I had to figure out in Etsy, I had to figure out what are they, what is that even called? Like, I'm like mm-hmm. mouse in the bottom of coffee mug. Anyway, it turns out it's called a surprise cup. And I found the cutest um, Etsy maker for that. So the more specific you can be with your search terms, if you're past the browsing phase, does that make sense? So it's like a little yeah. bit of both a yin and a yang. So I love that. Those are great tips. Um, which brings us, I guess, to the other thing. And you kind of touched on this a little bit about how eBay used to be. Um, but there still sometimes is that hesitation. Like I'm going to buy this thing and there's no way I'm going to get it on time yeah. or I can't talk to the artisan or I don't really know this store that well or whatever. Um, just the fact that I'm going to have to wait for it makes me a little nervous. So mm-hmm. have you had times when it just hasn't worked out? Do you have any tips around avoiding that? Um, no, because I think I just waited until the online reviews and the star rating system has really solved a lot of that. I think yeah. I hate to say it. Um, the, my parents one time tried to order a used drum set, like for a lot of money on eBay for my brother and they paid and it was never shipped. Now this is in like 1990 nine or something like that. And so that was burned into my, there were times when that could happen and it was really hard to do anything about it. So I would say, read the reviews, um, and look at the star ratings, look at how many sales they do. So like on Etsy, if they're doing a lot of sales, they have a lot of inventory in their shop and they have a good star rating. And you can see that people have actually bought this stuff recently. I think that's all you need to do. Like, I think I used to overthink this vetting process. And now I feel like just like an Amazon, just like an Amazon rating, like if there's a one or two bad reviews, but everything else looks really good, you're like, eh, it's probably OK. And so I think that's that's kind of the same. So um, and, and then, you can also see like so specifically what the review was and then how the person responded. Mm-hmm. So like if it was just a mistake and then they made it right, you probably can feel pretty good about buying from them, even if some you know, even if there's like one two star review. Yes, exactly. And and how long ago that review was, if it was, you know, not recently. Um, and then on the same note, like leaving reviews or leaving ratings or even just um, messaging the seller, if you have like a specific question or a shipping question, they they tend to be the good ones should be very responsive. So I don't think you need to feel like you can talk to them just like you would at your at your local craft fair. So. I love that. Yeah. Um, we are going to talk about, you know, shopping locally, like literally locally at a, at a craft fair. Um, but I did want to add just one thing that popped into my head when we were talking about um, from someone who's not oriented to that. Mm-hmm. One kind of thing I have done before is just gotten a bunch of stuff from one site I rec- or that I trust. Mm-hmm. So like one year I bought a whole bunch of people gifts from Minted because mm-hmm. I'd used Minted. I understood it. I trusted it. And it was easy because I thought everyone that's on my auxiliary list, so not yes. my kids, but on my other list is going to get a print. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that just simplified it for me. Whereas if I had been trying to bop around the internet and buy unique gifts for all those people at different places, I think I would have been really overwhelmed. So just something to throw in there. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I'm curious, since you do not do much of your small business and handmade shopping online, where in St. Joe, Michigan, do you shop? Oh, there's so many places. I'm so glad you asked. So we do have a really (laughs) cute little downtown. Um, where we have an art co-op, which is, well, I don't know how art co-ops are in other towns, but in ours, it's just like, it's a permanent storefront okay. that has rotating artists inside. Okay. And it could be anything from fine art, but mostly it's um, ceramics and jewelry and fun little signs and things. So that could be like a fun place to pop in and get some inspiration. We've also got several visual art centers where artists will have, um, like little studios inside Mm -hmm. and they often have a little shop. That's another, we have a couple of those. Um, All of the larger churches have some kind of bazaar or fair around the holidays, which Mm -hmm. is a fun place to go get grandma's crocheted baby blankets. But also like, that's a totally stereotypical thing. There's also, you know, making and crafting have come a long way. (laughs) Um, So there's lots of places where you can find that kind of thing. Um, We didn't talk at all about us personally hand making gifts and, that is not something we're going to get into in this episode very yeah. much. Um, although we do have a blog post coming about that on Monday yes. um, with ideas of things to make if you want to hand make gifts. But a lot of the same places I just rattled off will also have like workshops where you can come oh, make something. That's a great idea. So like, let's say it's like you don't know how to make a, a beaded necklace or you don't want to go buy all the stuff. A lot of these places will have um, a place where you can pop in for an hour and do that. Um, I love that we'll idea. Have, yeah, we'll have some more specifics about that um, in the blog post that we're going to put up Monday. But that's another thing. Like if you don't really know how to do something, but it's something relatively simple and someone else has all the supplies and know-how, that can be kind of a fun way to get them something that feels like it was artisan made, even though you you aren't necessarily 
an artisan with a capital A. Yeah. Um, a lot of places around here, like breweries and wineries and um, sometimes like stores that aren't of this store's kind will have like a pop-up shop inside. Okay. So um, you might show up at this brewery and they've got like the whole place is kind of been turned into a market. Um, or there's one, like, there's a distillery here that does that. Um, they do one on the fairgrounds, but that one's in the fall. Would you say a lot of these are schedule specific? Like they only run certain weeks? Are some of them permanent? And then for those that aren't permanent, like how do you find out about these and make sure you go when they're open? Yeah. So this is the kind of thing where if you're on Facebook, pay attention to your Facebook events. I okay. know it's very easy for me to ignore those. But if you are connected to anyone in your community who's in the know, you will probably get those events. You'll be invited to them. Okay. Especially if you're in a smaller town. Um, some of them are yearly. Like there's a couple that happen around here um, in October or November, and they're just a one-time deal. But then a lot of the places have them pretty regularly. Okay. Um, so like there's a brewery in town that does a Maker fair. I want to say once a month year round. Okay. So like during the holiday, it becomes a much bigger thing. And it's like a lot of stuff. And during the rest of the year, it's not as big, but they have like a presence all the time. Um, so those are, and also like if you have a local little free paper or like, um, you know, your local media site, things Mm -hmm. like that, they usually will list those kinds of things. And, um, we also have a lot of little boutiques in, in town. And I like to look like specifically for Michigan made things often. Mm -hmm. I think that's special, especially if I was sending it to someone out of state. I like, I get a kick out of being able to send them something Michigan made. And that is very common to find around here, like a specific boutique with all Michigan made stuff. Yes. I think I've Um, been in maybe in one of yours. Yeah. I'm sure you have. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just like, it's a fun, easy way to kind of find something unique. Um, I also just have a lot of local friends and acquaintances who make things and Mm -hmm. you'd be surprised. People don't always talk about it. Like, it, you wouldn't always necessarily know that so and so from your play group or from you know your kid's preschool pickup line also has a business doing prints yeah. or like making jewelry mm-hmm. or ceramics. Like sometimes that comes out in other ways. So that's one reason to do you know to take a, a tip from Sarah's book and just ask people about what you know what they do, what they're into, yeah. and sometimes you'll find out about that stuff. Yeah, no, that's such that's such a good point, and I think even a lot of makers are hesitant to feel like at least in person that they're constantly spamming their friends, so right. they may actually be less likely to bring it up, even if they're hustling to do some holiday sales online or through their yeah. marketing channels. And yeah, you might not even know. I had a great conversation with a mom who has an organic skincare company, and I had like forgotten that she made soaps and all these other things. So yeah, sometimes it'll be kind of this like sheepish like. You'll see them put up a Facebook post where they'll tag their own business, but they'll never really come out and say, yeah, I'm taking orders. And so I have found myself doing some digging to see who's who's making what, who's selling it and who could use the business. Yes, absolutely. OK, so I love this idea. And I also love to we have the Sawdust Art Festival down here that I love. And um, I love this in theory, but I get stuck on the the same thing, which is like, are you walking in and browsing for anyone? Are you going in with someone in mind? And like, how do you reconcile this maker browsing with your actual, like, got to buy gifts for these people? Right. Well, this, this would again be for me very different depending on what time of year it is. So if this was something I went to in the fall, um, like prior, anytime prior to December, you know, 10th, let's say, I would probably just wander around and see what I like. And then that becomes the basis for which the list is created, Mm -hmm. you know, or off which the list is created. Mm -hmm. If it's after that, it's either going to be stocking fillers for the kids um, or little, you know, little things just to kind of round things out. In which case I might have to talk myself out of getting something I really like because I don't, that kid doesn't need anything more. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it becomes like I have a person in mind, but I don't have any idea what they want. I'm just going to go browse. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of a blend of both. And like the time of year will kind of dictate that. Um, I definitely would recommend going in with an open mind. You're not going to find, especially like when you go into say a pop-up shop or a church bazaar, you're, there's no keyword search Mm -hmm. here. You know what I mean? Like you're going to get what you're going to (laughs) get. And that's so true. (laughs) I'm just picturing this like near future reality where you walk in and you have like your like AI lenses in and you like yes. look around and it's like beep, boop, 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 yes and you just like leads you to the little old lady stall but like doesn't really work that way yeah. it's so funny I mean and also <laughs> you're often gonna find something that's like close to being what you want but it's not so like last year I went to this um at a brewery they have this big it's called the holiday bazaar but it's b-i-z-a-r-r-e okay. ha 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 
And they have great artisan stuff. And it was really fun. The whole, like both floors and it's in this old building. It was really, really cool. And I found these adorable little notebooks and I thought, oh, this would be so great for Clara. And then I realized that every single one had some marijuana reference on the front. Oh, like dear. one said like pothead and I didn't even get, it was like a pot on top of a head right. and I didn't get it. I was like, what's this? And then I was like, <laughs> oh, pothead. Okay. And then like another one was like a marijuana leaf. And so I was like, okay, so these aren't going to work. And then I, I dug through the stack. And found like a plain one at the bottom that just had like a little acorn or something on the front. And so I had to do some searching and I didn't find it. But I also had to be kind of ready just to walk away and not get her something she would have thought was really, really cute. Yeah. You know, a little inappropriate. So can we talk about price points for these things? So um, one of my favorite things down here is called the Sawdust Art Festival. But it is very much a it would be like art gallery prices for a lot of things. Not everything. There are some. But um. So I'm curious if like you have found a way to know like where your price point is. And also like, of course, we want to support local artisans and local businesses. Um, Have you found like that sweet spot between paying what, of course, it's worth and supporting that business, but not getting like I have gotten surprised sometimes like, oh, look at this cute Santa figurine. Wait, why is it seventy five dollars? You know, right. Well, for me, there's a little bit of a difference. Sometimes there's a store that is just a small store. It's a boutique. Okay. And they are carrying things that I would have a hard, a hard time finding elsewhere. But if I really wanted to, I could, right? Um, that's to me different than something that's truly handmade, that it's literally one of a kind. So I'm a little more generous when it's a handmade one of a kind thing because mm-hmm. I know the time that went into it and I can't buy it elsewhere. Right. Um, when it's something that is... Like, I love that it's in this downtown shop. I want that shop to exist. I love that it's curated. I love that it makes it easy for me to walk in and have this experience. Um, But I could probably find that thing online. Mm -hmm. I'm a little, I'm not stingy about it. I'll still pay more, but I won't pay as much more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So maybe I'll pay like 20% more Mm -hmm. than I would if I bought it on Amazon or 25% more. It also depends how much it is to begin with. If this is a $20 item, I don't really care if this is a, $70 $70 item that I could get someplace else for 40, then I'm going to start thinking. So it's, it's really the overall budget. It's how much do I want this, this store to continue? Like what was yeah. the shopping experience? Like, am I buying anything else? Is there something else I can buy and pass this thing up? Like, have I subsidized that purchase to some extent with some less expensive right. purchases? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a, like in my head, it's this very complicated algebra equation. Yeah. What about you? I think the same. I hear what you're saying about wanting to support. There's a difference between wanting to support just local businesses as kind of a philosophical decision to support right. your town's local businesses versus what you're paying for something that is one of a kind handmade. And so that that does help my brain. I think um, it is a challenge for people who want to buy. And I'm thinking specifically handmade and like original art. It just yes. gets very expensive. Um, so just little ways I think I have found is you can buy something very small for, yes. from someone who is charging, you know, premium prices for say like a large art print, but you might find like a little postcard print and, um, do something with that. So that's usually when I'm at sawdust, which again, there is more like art gallery prices on things. They have blown glass and paintings and like really, really cool stuff. I'm just usually buying the smallest Thing that they have. No, that's totally, yeah. Like you buy the necklace with the blown glass pendant uh-huh. and not the huge, well, yeah. and like no one, I don't think anyone on my shopping list expects me to buy them fine art. For no, their home. no, Certainly, no. You know what I mean? Certainly I'm not even buying that for myself right now. Right. Um, it reminds me of this time I went into this store in Stratford, Ontario, which there's a big theater festival there. And this little tiny shop, this the most adorable little hobbit hole mm-hmm. with this adorable older gentleman who does all these like hand like line sketches Mm -hmm. of nature scenes. And I looked at the price I wanted almost like passed out, but I was like, I want one, (laughs) I want something so badly. And so I bypassed all the framed anything, like no framed anything literally. And I finally found this tiny little bunny. (laughs) He's probably like, I don't know, like I could, I could put my thumb and and index finger in a circle around this bunny. Like that's how little he is. And I just right now have them on this like nice stock paper. I have them and it was still like $45, by the way. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but I'm sure it took this guy like hours to yeah. draw. It's amazing. And so right now it's just propped up against um, something in my bedroom. Eventually I will find a teeny tiny frame and yeah. put it in there and figure out where to go, where to put it. So that's the kind of thing it's like, I'm so glad I got it. Mm-hmm. I would have blown that 45 or $50 a million times by now. But like, 
I also wasn't going to, you know, spend $450 on a five by seven yeah. framed version of that. <laughs> so like, or whatever it yeah. was, it was ridiculous, yeah. but I wanted it anyway. So like, it, it's kind of like, I don't know. There's like the gut check, right? I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think that's just worth, worth talking about. Well, yeah. I want to wrap up with maybe just something that I feel like I have learned as I've shopped more maker and handmade. And that is, I used to get really stuck on whether the thing I was buying, and I'm speaking specifically if it's art or decor related. Um, I used to get really stuck on whether the thing I was buying fit the style and the preferences of of the person I was giving it to. So for example, I bought you a print of a heron because we had a conversation about herons. Um, But I could have easily gotten hung up on like, if that matched with your living room art or where would you hang it or what kind of frame should I get? Or like, let's say it's a pretty linen set of napkins or something like that. Um, I have really tried to push past that because when I receive artisan gifts, I often actually really like if there's something a little different than what I'm going to see at my major retailers at Target at agreed. So I would, if you're giving me a gift, I am totally okay. If it's more modern or more eclectic or more, funky than what I would usually get because there's story and an art and like a a human behind it, both of the person who picked it out for me and the person who made it. And I feel like that completely changes the lens through which I view aesthetics. Does that make sense? And so I've tried to train and I've gotten much better about it. My, I have hanging on my family room wall, a pencil sketch of like a, it looks, it's like a toddler age child. People often ask if it's one of my own children. My brother found it in a thrift store in this kind of gold, dingy gold painted frame. And I could have had it. Re- I never even reframed it because the fact that someone picked out a cool pencil sketch from a thrift store and gave it to me, I will always have that on my wall. And it doesn't, yeah. it didn't matter that it matched or didn't match. So that's just something to offer. If you feel intimidated by buying those types of things for people, I know as a receiver, I, I love it, even when it's not necessarily quote unquote my style. I totally agree. And I think that nowadays, if you look, if you even browse through a place like Etsy, there is an aesthetic, even if it's not matchy matchy, and even if it's something is a little more eclectic or funky or, or vintage looking or modern, or whatever stuff still kind of hangs together. Yeah. A and B an eclectic look is what we're really all going for in our yeah. homes. And it takes years to get that. Mm-hmm. Like it takes years and, and sort of accumulating and having experiences to get that look naturally. So I love it when yes. someone sends me something, even if I never would have picked it out for myself, I love having that to mix things up because I didn't have to do it myself. Like mm-hmm. I didn't have to Agreed. be the one to take the risk, but now I always find a place for everything. And the hair and actually that you sent me is perfectly in my aesthetic and matches like not matches is the wrong word, but fits very easily with other things. But like I've got antique um, pictures hanging in my wall that don't really necessarily fit the style of everything else. But when it all comes together, it looks really cool. And that's, I think what everyone's kind of going for. We just don't want to have to do it for ourselves. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 Well with that, it is time to wrap up, but this was really fun. I'm really motivated actually to get out in my community and do some more shopping. And I think I'm going to try to solve Etsy this year. You can do it. I can do it. You can do it. It's even gotten better. Just remember those search terms. Be really specific. (laughs) Well, thanks everybody so much for listening. And thanks again to our sponsor, Privacy Guard. To learn more about them and their credit protection and total protection plan, visit privacyguard.com. Yeah, thanks to Privacy Guard. And thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back here tomorrow with part three in our holiday shopping series. Talk to you then. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code the Mom Hour 20 to save 20%. Hi, friends. Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Tea's Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Tea's Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Tease Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Tease Made.